I think we're ready to start. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is the first ever public debate about drugs here at Davos, at the World Economic Forum. So we're very excited. This is uh, historic. And uh, we're very excited to have this panel here today. I want to start out by breaking protocol to the delight of our organizers. So please keep your phones on as long as they're in silence. Just keep them on so you can share any photographs, video, ideas about what's uh, shown here today. Um, we're very happy to be co-hosting this Univision and Fusion with the World Economic Forum, as I said. And uh, before I, I present the panel, who needs no introduction really, I want to direct your attention to the faces in our backdrop. And that has to do with um, the fact that we're discussing this issue here today uh, at a very high level with policymakers, with uh, you know, uh, people who are involved in uh, human rights advocacy and, and of course who have a global perspective on, on this issue. But uh, we're discussing also an issue that affects people all over the world. From the poppy fields in Afghanistan to the streets of New York to the slums of Rio or Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. So um, keep that in mind as we move along with our discussion here today. Um, first of all, Kofi Annan, thank you so much for being here, President of the Annan Foundation and of course former Secretary General of the UN. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have Governor Rick Perry from Texas. Governor, um, you've been governor for 13 years now in Texas. So thank you so much for being here. It's my honor to be here. Thank the states are me. moving forward in the United States with drug policy, so it's very important to have the, the governor from Texas right here. President Juan Manuel Santos from Colombia. President, thank you so much. Thanks for being here again. And Kenneth Roth from Human Rights Watch. Uh, thank you so much, Kenneth. And, thank you. Uh, let's get started. Uh, I warned you in, in, in the speaker's room that I was going to ask you to come up with um, two to three sentences that shares your stance on, on drug policy. So let's start with you, Kenneth. All right, I mean, in my three-sentence version of um, drug policy, it's been a disaster. Um, it has inflicted enormous harm in terms of a mass incarcer incarceration rate, um, enormous violation of our privacy, huge violence through the cartels that the increased prices have fueled, and for what? Drug, drug use is not down. Um, it's time for a different approach. It's time to reassess. And the problem behind all of this, really, is the criminalization of private drug use. It's time to look to alternative ways to discourage or regulate drug use if we see it as an evil compared to alcohol or tobacco, but to move beyond the criminalization that is causing so much harm with so little to show for it. President Santos. Well, I come from. The, a country which probably is the country that has suffered most of all the countries in the world in this war against uh, narco-trafficking. At the same time, we, we have been relatively successful in uh, attacking and combating all the links of the chain. We have learned how to be successful against uh, cartels, against production, against the uh, marketing of, of drugs, uh, but we, after 40 years, feel that we are in a sort of static bicycle. We look to the right, we look to the left, and we're in the same environment with the same problems. So what I think we should do is rediscuss the strategy that the world has against drug trafficking and try to uh, to encounter, try to find new ways, more, uh, more effective ways to combat drug trafficking. Because what we are doing right now is not uh, the most successful and the best thing we can do. Governor Perry. Enrique, thank you. And, and uh, just before I start quickly, I want to say thanks to Professor Schwab for uh, the invitation to come and participate here. Mr. Secretary, Mr. President, Ken, thank you all for are participating well. I'm probably the only person who's going to be an anti-legalization uh, individual on the podium tonight. Uh, and, and with that said, uh, I want to say that uh, I come certainly with an open mind and an open ear. Uh, and some of the things that we've done in the states uh, to address the issue of how we keep from criminalizing and keeping uh, or using, if you will, uh, the issue of uh, initial drug use as a tool that puts people into prisons, that uh, gives them the opportunity to become hardened criminals. And, and we've been very successful in the state of Texas with drug courts. 
Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, looking at uh, the issues of, of criminalization and of dealing with those individuals who have been uh, brought into our criminal justice system. Today, Texas criminal justice system is at 96% of capacity. When you look at other states like California, uh, that is well north of 150% of capacity, you have to ask the question, what are they doing in these, uh, these different states? And we all compete against each other for ideas and concepts. So I bring to the table that I think it's bad public policy to, uh, for the government to say, here's one more uh, substance that is not good for you. And science clearly tells us that this is a substance not good for you. How do we address the issues of substance abuse and criminalization? And I think that is what uh, you're seeing some laboratories of innovation in the states be very successful with. Interesting. We're, we're going to get in depth into that. Secretary General. Yeah. Let me <clears throat> say that I, I believe that uh, drugs has destroyed many people. But wrong governmental policies have destroyed many more. Mm -hmm. And we need to really look at the policy and ask ourselves simply, sincerely, and honestly, is this policy working? What are the effects of this policy? And if it's not working, do we have the courage to change it? At least there's a need for serious public debate on this issue. In some countries where anyone you know knows someone who's had, who has been impacted negatively with the issue of drugs. But the question is, are we ready to take a, and make an honest review? Um, you recently published an, uh, an article uh, at the end of last year calling for the end of the uh, so-called drug uh, war on drugs. And you say there's uh, a clear evidence that this policy has failed. But still, there's no um, commitment to changing things or looking for new approaches. What do you think that is? No, I think basically we feel that one should look at it, <coughs> come at it from the point of view of education and health, and help these people get off it. When we realized prohibition wasn't working, we had the courage to change it. If we admit that the drug policy and the repressive laws on drugs have failed, and it ends up throwing so many people in jail. I don't know if the governor can confirm this, but I'm told in the US, for example, the government spends more money on prisons than on education. Obviously, there's something wrong when one is confronted with this situation. Is this a situation that can be defended? Isn't this a situation that is crying out for review and different policies? I would leave it there. Let's get into that a little bit. Kenneth, 1.5 million people are arrested every year in the US alone for uh, drug crimes. The vast majority of those, 80%, around 80%, are for simple marijuana possession. And of those arrests, blacks and Latinos are twice, sometimes three times more likely to be arrested than whites who consume marijuana at similar rates. Mm -hmm. So there's a racial component to drug policy and to this criminalization of, of drug uh, consumption in the US? I mean, you're absolutely right, although your figures are off. OK. Um, <laughs> so the, not absolutely right. Yeah, no, it's worse than what you say. Human Rights Watch did a study recently where we went state by state looking at the ratio of whites who were imprisoned for nonviolent drug use and blacks. And as I recall, the worst state was Illinois, my, my place where I was born, which was something like a 50 to 1 ratio. If you were a, a black man, you were 50 times more likely to be imprisoned for drug use than a white man. So there's an enormous racial disparity. And indeed, I think Americans wouldn't put up with this degree of incarceration for mere private use of drugs if, it was surely, if the burden was fared surely across the board. The fact that it is falling so disproportionately on a minority is part of why it persists. But it is, you know, it is the main driving factor behind America's enormous over-incarceration problem. Um, and this is an issue not simply of misplaced resources, as Kofi Annan mentions. Um, it, it also, it destroys lives. I mean, you take people who are being given enormous prison terms, 15, 20, 25 years right. for use, and you have to say, you know, how do you justify this? 
you know, yes, there is some harm to drug use. There's some harm to alcohol use. There's some harm to tobacco use. We learn to deal with those harms through education, through treatment programs, through non-penalization methods. And the issue isn't legalization. The issue is decriminalization. Right. Um, there's got to be a better way than ruining so many people's lives just because they, in their, the privacy of their own home or at a party, have decided to use drugs. And I mentioned the United if States. Uh, of, course, we, of course. If we may ask uh, Richard to explain the difference between legalization and decriminalization. Yes. Because often when you talk, you ask for change, they think you are asking for legalization of drugs. And there's a fine difference, and I would want you to explain to our audience. Sure. Yes. That's, that's worth, I think it's worth yes. dedicating well, time sure. to. Yeah, I mean, the, the difference is quite simply, you know, criminalization means that you can be convicted of a crime and put in prison. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, the way it works, you put, get put in prison for a very long time. Um, but you don't have to legalize. You don't have to say it's carte blanche, anything goes. You can still regulate it. You can make sure that kids under 18 don't get it. You can make sure that things are properly labeled, that doses are regulated so you don't have overdoses. Um, ideally, in my view, you also regulate the supply chain, which is a way of undermining the market that fuels the murderous drug cartels. So you know, I'd like it so that you can do the equivalent of going to a pharmacy to get drugs. It would kill the market that is driving violence in, in, in Colombia, yes. in Mexico, and Guatemala. Yeah. Um, so we, that's what, you know. We, we estimated that um, drug cartels in Mexico would lose anywhere in between two to 20 billion dollars with the marijuana legalization in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the US, because I have the figures from the US, but this happens also, the, the racial component and the socioeconomic component in Brazil, in Colombia, in Mexico, mm -hmm. all over the place. Well, you, you were asking why, why to Mr. Kofi Annan, uh, the world has not reacted to this failure. Right. Uh, and I want to get your perspective and, and, and Rick Perry's and I perspective. Tell, I, will, I will tell you my point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an extremely sensitive issue politically. Uh, usually uh, serving heads of state don't even touch the issue. They touch it after their heads of state. Uh, the, uh, uh, why? Because because it's very sensitive. That's why uh, I uh, proposed in the Summit of the, Ameri of the Americas, I proposed to President Obama, to all the presidents of the Americas, that uh, we give a, a mandate to the OAS to study the problem in depth. Because most of the times, you, uh, people approach this issue with a prejudice, with a preconceived idea. So objective studies, really what, what's going to happen with consumption if, mm -hmm. if you legalize or if you decriminalize, uh, we don't have those figures uh, worldwide. So we have to start by looking for the actual facts. What is, it, what is happening? What really are <clears throat> the problems? And then collectively, because this is an issue that not one country can solve it. It's a multinational, it's a world, global problem. <coughs> Collectively, we can then start to discuss new approaches, uh, new ways to be more effective. And that's, I think, what we're doing. In, in next month or in, in March, there's going to be a, a meeting uh, in Vienna, mm -hmm. and there's going to be a general assembly, specifically in the United Nations, yeah. to discuss this issue in the year 2016. I hope that by then, all the think, tank, think tanks, uh, universities, and, and many countries uh, could have a more clear idea of what to do. Because today, quite frankly, uh, nobody really knows how to approach this how problem. To approach. And I interrupted you because I'm in, especially interested in your perspective and in Rick Perry's perspective, because you're both currently in government. and you're. You might pay a political cost for taking a it's, leadership it's decision. It's more popular to have uh, the position of the governor than my position. Well, I, think, I, I, I can think tell both, you. Well, <laughs> in, in a state like Texas, there's a, uh, you know, a political cost for taking leadership in, a, in an issue like this. And, and, and here's an interesting thing, and I think it's really important that you laid out the difference between decriminalization and legalization. And often when we have this conversation, people talk about legalizing drugs. And, and I think, as you heard me say in my opening remarks, I am not for legalization of drugs. And what we've done in the state of Texas over the last decade 
through these drug courts is do exactly what you have said. Didn't get a lot of uh, national publication uh, of what we had done. And, and I will assure you that the Obama administration uh, has not talked about Texas and bragged about what Texas has done too often over the course of the last five or six years. But the, uh, the Attorney General uh, pointed out to Texas and the drug courts and the way that we have dealt with these over the course of the last decade uh, to, to be able to decriminalize uh, this issue and to lighten the load, if you will. Now, yes, Mr. Secretary, I, I, I do agree or disagree with you in, in, in that analysis. We don't spend uh, as much money on incarceration as we do on education uh, in the state of I Texas. That and, 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 that's, uh, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, but the fact is, is the, what we have done, and, and, and again, I think states are laboratories of innovation. I hope other states will look at what we have done in the state of Texas from the standpoint of thoughtfully putting into place these drug courts where we give shock probation, where we give treatment, where we allow young people whose lives would be destroyed forever if they went into the prison system an opportunity to expunge their records and after a period of time to walk back into society, or actually to stay in society and be contributing but, but still, members. still, Texas has one of the highest incarceration rates in the United States, I think the fifth for my, um, drug possession. But, but uh, Around the fifth, and, and I want to get Kenneth's me, perspective on the drug or, courts too. Or, 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 or can I ask a very- I haven't been governor forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, 13 years is a pretty yeah, long time. If I could address Texas for- That's why I said at the beginning. But, but, I, think, I think by all means, you know, the drug courts, anything that decriminalizes is good. But in, and whether this is you know, a lingering problem, whether it's your problem, there's a big problem in Texas. I mean, if you take Texas out of the United States for a second and compare it with the That's world. It's been talked about before. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 I know, yeah. I think you, you, you know, I'm sure. I mean, compare Texas to Germany. Texas has one third the population, two and a half times the people in prison. Um, if you put Texas and put it on a global chart, um, there are country. only two island nations with a higher rate of incarceration than Texas. So, and, and drugs are not the whole problem, but drugs are about 20% of no, the problem. Don't get confused that we yeah. are soft on crime. Right, but, but, but you know, so this, and then we could have the broader conversation, but drugs are still about 20% of the problem. So yeah. I think anything that can decriminalize the approach yeah. to mere use is very worth doing. Uh, Thank you, and, and which is what we're doing. Okay. I want to, uh, you wanted to say something. No, that, you, no I was saying, I, to, another thing. I think uh, the discussions have clarified mm -hmm. this question of, uh, uh, the resources going to prisons mm -hmm. and education. Mm -hmm. The governor, mercifully says has clarified that Texas doesn't spend more on prisons than on education, and I accept that. You said that sometimes it looks like we're on a static bicycle, and two years ago, President we're Santos. We're on a static bicycle, and we are more and more confused. I will ask you a question. Sure. How can I tell a peasant, a campesino from uh, mountains in Colombia, that he has half a hectare growing marijuana, that he will go to jail because of that. If in Colorado or in the state of Washington, it's legal to smoke For recreational marijuana. Purposes. How, how, how can you explain that? No, not only that, so 22 a, states have medical marijuana laws in the, in the United is, States. This is a, a major contradiction of what is happening right now, which uh, in a way uh, shows the need to have a, a worldwide discussion, an in-depth discussion about this issue. Was it easy to advance this debate, this discussion, during your tenure as uh, Secretary General of the United Nations? Well, it wasn't at the center. It wasn't at the center of discussions. Uh, the UN Drugs Program is based in Vienna, and most of the discussions take place there. Uh, you often have attorney generals, chiefs of police, and others going there to have discussions. But uh, it's, 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 it's moved up the political agenda now, and I don't think we can push it back. And I think it's important yeah, that uh, pursue yeah. it seriously. I there's a, I mean, Kofi Annan is touching on a real problem at yeah. the international level, mm -hmm. yeah. in that drug policy is discussed by the law enforcement people exactly. in Vienna. And we need to stop viewing it simply as a law enforcement That's problem. We, need to, we need, do we need to look at it as a public health problem? Exactly. And the question is, you know, it does some harm, drug use, but the fight against drug use using criminal law does enormous harm by ruining people's lives by putting them in prison, but also we haven't talked that much about this, by fueling the market 
that creates the drug cartels, where you've had, you know, what, 25,000 people disappeared in Mexico, 100,000 killed, and these are people killed not and only by the, displaced, and not, is, not, right, but not, it's not only about by the cartels, but it's also then by the military response to the cartels. You have a, you know, a virtual war going on you know, along the US-Mexican border. And this is very much a product of the market that criminalization has created. I think this is a perfect time to transition into this issue. Um, just last week, the Surgeon General in the United States said that um, 8 million deaths, 8 million people have, are still alive, basically, thanks to the war on tobacco. So a little bit over 50 years ago, the first report from the Surgeon General came out in the United States, and it said that um, it warned about the dangers of tobacco. So here we have a public health issue being dealt you know, as, a, as a public health issue. And higher taxation, limits to where people can smoke, limits to the advertising of tobacco. And no criminalization. And, and of course, no criminalization. <laughs> 50 years later, 8 million deaths have been prevented. And I'm not saying we've solved that issue, but I think we've come a long way. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have prohibition. Mm -hmm. Pretty much the same time frame, a little over 50 years. Mm -hmm. And that has brought about more production, more consumption, and more people dying because of this police approach to it. A public health issue being dealt with as a safety public issue. So isn't it time to take action? In, is it a fair comparison? Well, this is why I'm asking for, for us to take a serious, honest review of the policies as they exist today. And look at the history. And you've provided examples on alcohol and prohibition, uh, the impact. And we have enough, even if we don't have it globally, we have enough in key countries to be able to make a judgment as to whether the policies we have today are working and, and why we should change them. And what you're outlining <laughs> is that you don't have to just throw your hands up yeah, and say exactly. drugs have you know, carte blanche when you decriminalize. You can be quite aggressive in discouraging use through education, through opiate substitute programs. You can bring in needle exchange programs freely, which prevent HIV distribution. I mean, you can, y there's a lot you can do through education, treatment, and, and you know, public health measures that would discourage use without ruining lives through criminalization and fueling the violence that criminalization is. And, and the example in Portugal and all the way yes, they've Portugal. done this shows a, mm -hmm. a good result. Mm -hmm. so it's a good example. Uh, public opinion seems to be behind this uh, around the world. Um, but you, you have a re-election coming up? Uh, public opinion in general. If you ask people, uh, do you want uh, the drugs to be decriminalized or legalized? In general, they say no. Why? Because they, they understand that this, the drugs are bad. And nobody, I think, disagrees that legal drugs, or illegal drugs, drugs are terrible. Uh, would they, 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 they poison your kids. Um, but uh, the issue has to be uh, exactly. looked at in a more comprehensive way. And when, when you, you weigh the pros and cons, uh, then, and, and, you, and you are able to explain, for example, on the human rights, from the human rights perspective, simply by taking away those huge profits that go directly to these gangs that are uh, multiplying uh, by the day in Central America and uh, South America. The, we're starting to have really big problems in Brazil, in Argentina, right. all around. They're, they're growing. Mm -hmm. uh, to take away those huge profits, simply to do that would be an enormous, enormous uh, benefit for humanity. Mm -hmm. And you go to Afghanistan or you go uh, all the, the corridor from, from the Middle East to, to, to Europe. Uh, right. I was in Spain yesterday. The Spanish consumption is going up. The UK, the consumption is going up, but the profits from drugs are also going up. Also, they're becoming more powerful. Governor Perry, uh, during the last week, President Obama, the uh, majority leader in the Senate, Harry Reid, and Republican Governor Chris Christie, they all talked about marijuana legalization. So there's political momentum in the US. Yeah. Do you want to jump right into that? <laughs> Not, notwithstanding the two politicians on the, uh, the dais here, we'll, we'll take ourselves out of the picture because we certainly would never 
uh, jump out in front of a parade just because that's where the public sentiment <laughs> seems to be going. Right. Uh, but the fact is, uh, I, I think it's very important for science to continue to play a okay. most important role in this before we jump to some conclusion, before we run out and get in the, uh, the front of a parade that's going somewhere because we think that's where the public opinion is. Uh, and I, I want to share just one thing or make a response to uh, the Secretary about Portugal and uh, the, uh, the legalization of drugs there. In the five years since that... Uh, uh, that has occurred there, 40% increase in the murder rate in that country. So, now again, anecdotal, I totally understand it, but the fact is we need to look at all of the data, the science. Uh, the uh, young Congressman Kennedy uh, lectured the president a little bit on his remarks about marijuana uh, that he smoked as a young man and alcohol uh, is basically the same. And uh, Kennedy said, uh, Mr. President, do not make the mistake that the marijuana that was used 30 years ago is the same today as it was, or that is today, genetically improved, incredibly potent uh, drug. So uh, again, science needs to be front and center before we make any decisions uh, at, at, the, at the level of, of the, the legalization or even the decriminalization of some of these, uh, these substances that we're but, talking about. But nonetheless, about. Uh, I mean, decisions are being made. 22 states have legalized medical I mean, marijuana in the U.S. Two states have <laughs> recreational use. Now New Hampshire uh, can become the first state to legalize marijuana through their um, uh, legislative uh, And you know branch. that I am a staunch proponent of the Tenth Amendment, that the states need to be given substantially more authority in making decisions, whether it's on their health care or whether it's issues like this. And then the people will decide where they want to live, whether it's economic policies or whether it's social policies, the issues of traditional marriage or abortion and the restrictions of abortion. I might uh, limit it that. But those states according to our Constitution in the United States, should be allowed to make those decisions and not this one-size-fits-all mentality that we seem to see coming out of Washington, D.C. today. You want to say there's, something? There's one, one other issue that I think is important to, to uh, mention here. This is um, the perfect uh, example of where the balloon effect uh, becomes effective. Colombia. We have managed to reduce the production of cocaine 60 percent. Right. We were able to dismantle the all-powerful cartels. They were invincible, mm -hmm. uh, according to the world press. All of them are uh, the drug lords are dead or in jail. We have been uh, very successful in destroying the labs and the chains of, of marketing. Uh, we still have the problem. But what, is, what has happened? Central America and the Caribbean and Mexico are in flames, and our neighbors are now producing more than Colombia. So the balloon effect is, uh, is really in, uh, in working there. So that's why I, I insist that we must approach this problem multinationally, uh, all the world if possible, because otherwise it will go from one, one place to the other. Uh, we went by the book. Uh, the, the war on drugs, according to the United Nations, was applied in Colombia perfectly. And look what happened. This is a perfect example of, of uh, something that doesn't work very well, and that's why we need all of us to have a new approach. Kenneth, before opening up uh, the questions to the public, are we moving at a fast enough pace? Because we've been talking about the need for a new approach for a while now. Now we have more voices, important voices. You know, coming to this debate, we have a debate here and that was for the first time, but are we moving fast enough? Well, obviously I want to see things move more quickly, but there's been you know, very good experimentation in the United States. I, I agree with Governor Perry that we want to let the states experiment. And you know, I think the federal government has wisely backed off. And so with the handful of states that are now decriminalizing marijuana use, they're saying, okay, you know, as long as you know, within some limits, we'll let you do that. And, and that's a healthy approach. Um, I think we want to see that kind of experimentation taking place at the international level, too, which means revising the drug regime in Vienna, um, because the international treaties are terrible in this area. Um, and we've got to interpret them in a way that allows for this kind of experimentation. Because you know, frankly, as, as President Santos says, the, um, this balloon effect is real. And the reason for it is the massive draw 
of drug profits, which are a direct consequence of criminalization. The way to stop the balloon from simply shifting is to puncture it. And you puncture it by destroying the market. You do that by decriminalizing, and suddenly there's nothing left for the cartels. Let, let, let me just in, inject there and ask you mm -hmm. and, and the panel's sure. opinion, because you, you talk, uh, we, we talk about uh, the monetary aspect of this. Mm -hmm. What is the answer from the standpoint of the banking industry's uh, responsibility in this issue? Because the fact of the matter is, if you're not able to launder these dollars and you use them in other ways, mm -hmm. uh, it, it becomes somewhat uh, of, a, of a negative impact upon the drug cartel. So yeah, what is the responsibility of the banking industry in this issue? Let's follow I'll, the money I'll, for, I'll, for her. I'll answer that. One of the difficulties we have had in Colombia for many years is that when we go after the money, suddenly there's a wall. Mm. And you cannot penetrate that wall. Mm -hmm. The secrecy of the banking industry uh, is, uh, is one of the impediments to be more effective in going after, especially the money. Uh, when, you, when you fight the, the, the chain, the price goes up uh, link by link. Right. You know, if, you, if you go, the, the, most the, the most expensive, but the least uh, effective is go going after production. If you seize the cocaine when it's in the US market, for example, it's much more harmful to the chain. Because of the margins of profit. But the most successful is when you go after the money. And there, we have a bottleneck. And we don't hear a lot about uh, banking institutions uh, paying the price for laundering money. Recently, I think, uh, I think it was HSBC that was um, penalized for it. But uh, is there also something to be said about the, the financial institutions? I haven't really looked, looked into that. But obviously, it's an important uh, aspect. But nothing of what we are discussing here is going to be easy to do. Mm -hmm. And we, we should expect difficulties, and it's also we focused a lot on the U.S., right. but it's not a U.S. problem alone. It is a global problem. Right. We need to educate the public. We need to educate uh, families. And they themselves know drug is a bad thing for their children. They will resist. But we need to have a public, a serious public debate that leads to serious reform of the drug regime, starting, in, including the international regimes, that uh, govern this, because uh, if we look at the difficulties alone, we cannot do, do much. Right. And even the movement in the U.S. regarding uh, marijuana, which is a, a step in the right, it's only a step. There's much more to be done. How do we organize ourselves as an international community to ensure that enough countries and enough momentum is created to really <laughs> break the back of this drug problem once and for all. You talked of uh, the Caribbean and all this. They are moving to West Africa. The drug cartels moved to Guinea-Bissau, Guinea mm -hmm. using the West Coast through the Sahel to get drugs to Europe. One of them flew a Boeing 707 to Mali, offloaded the uh, goods, and burnt the plane. It shows you the margin, you know, if you can Ben at 707 <laughs> and still make profits, uh, the margins they are getting. So the tentacles are quite wide. And I, I agree with uh, Richard that we, we should also start looking at the international regime. In your experience, is it possible to, to build such a coalition? I mean, uh... it, 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 is, it depends on how you have to get civil society involved. We cannot leave it to the politicians alone. Earlier today, I was telling a group that civil society and individuals have power, which we sometimes don't under, uh, underestimate. They have power through their votes. They have power through their statements and actions, the choices they make. And they can put pressure on the leaders. And where leaders fail to lead, the people can make them follow. The people can lead. And this is an issue. In some country, everyone knows someone whose child, mother or father, has been affected by drugs. This is not a situation right. we want to work with. What has prevented us from rising up and making lots of noise that no politician can ignore? I think um, we can open the questions to the public. Uh, I see a few raised hands. <coughs> so someone's going to come up with a mic. We have uh, one on this side, and I think we should have one on the other side. So uh, let's start right here, because the mic is closer to that side. And then we'll come up 
to the front row. Thank you. Yeah. If you can just say your name and Hi, who the question is um, directed to. My name is Jia Ping from China, Beijing. I run an NGO named uh, Health Governance Initiative. <coughs> Basically, I'm a lawyer. So my uh, my understanding about the topic is, uh, is there is a hot debate currently uh, in the previous years about mm -hmm. drug policy. Uh, if I regard mm -hmm. the, the drug user as a client or consumers, and I regard the drugs itself as a goods, and I regard the so-called cutters, and the drug, drug, so-called big drug dealer or the criminal organizations as a corporate or entrepreneurs. So my question to Mr. Governor Perry is, uh, do you believe that uh, if, if we uh, put the consumer clients into the jail, can successfully make those corpor corporates uh, then be bankrupt and be eliminated Right. from the world. Right. I, and I, my, I, my, my qu second question to Mr. Rose is, i always confused, is do you believe that if we dealing with, as, as we claim, that dealing with these organizations, corporates, eliminated these entrepreneurs, can successfully reduce the supply to the society, to the consumers, because Human beings, it's because they bring a change right, because of addictions. So it's pe people naturally are pursuing pleasure. So do you believe that this could, could stop the pleasure pursuing of um, human beings? Yeah. Generally so, speaking, uh, the, the issue of, of putting uh, the supplier in, in the jailhouse, you don't really get to the, uh, the, the real culprit. Uh, you find some people in the chain, you, and, and again, uh, th th that has some effect, I would suggest to you a, a, a relatively small effect. I think it's more important uh, if you're going to hurt the supplier uh, of these drugs that you go after them where the, the, the real pain can be distributed and that is in their pocketbook and that is through the banking system uh, that I think is all too often uh, not engaged in this process. And one, one of the other things that, that again, back to science, and, and having the public's engagement of, of this and uh, the, these young people, our, our, our children, our friends that we see whose lives are being impacted by this, where science is being more engaged in finding some innovative solutions with compounds and what have you that can block the euphoric uh, nature of these drugs and what have you. So uh, not, not to get off subject, but I think it's another important thing that we uh, that we challenge our public institutions, our, our higher education institutions, uh, our, our federal governments who fund uh, research for uh, certain things that plague us as people, whether it's cancer, whatever it might be. But drug addiction is one of those that I would suggest to you we probably don't spend enough money on, both in the education side and finding the solutions to. Well, if you, I mean, first of all, I completely agree with Governor Perry that the um, treatment and education are key here. Treatment at this point, though, is undermined by criminalization because a lot of the addicts run away from the government, not toward the government to get treatment. Um, you know, the banking system, I used to be a prosecutor. You know, prosecutors are not dumb. They know to go after the money, but it's very hard to get the money. So I just, I, I don't think that that's the panacea. They're all, the prosecutors are already trying to get the money. But money is like water going down rapids. You know, you may put an obstacle here or a boulder there. It's going to find its way down to people's pockets. You know, and it's, so I think what you've got to do is stop the flow of the money. And so to come to your question, it is, um, you know, even if we assume the same demand for drugs, the money involved will rapidly diminish if um, the price goes down. And the price will go down if you decriminalize. So you know, somebody's going to still have to supply the drugs. I want them to be ordinary businesses. I don't want the profits to be so enormous that people are literally willing to kill for them. Because that's what we have right now. So it has a benefit for the, I mean, and that money can be used on public health to, uh, to well, have you, a. Well, obviously, you can tax and stuff, too. But you know, if you decriminalize, prices are going to go down. And, and so these enormous profits that people are literally willing to you know, kill their way to get, um, that's going to go away. Then it'll be the normal profits of, say, the pharmaceutical industry, which, you know, how do you know that the price will go down? Has it, have, they, have they gone down in Colorado and Washington? Well, no, but I mean, that's, the, that's still operating in a world where it's illegal to supply the stuff. But in other words, would you... They supply, the supply is there. Well, but the supply's got to get from Mexico or to Colombia but, or whatever to the United States, have, which is still illegal. We haven't seen a big price differential 
uh, after the le yeah. uh, legalizing in Colorado and Washington. I simply ask, ask the yeah. question. No, I understand the point, but I think it's really too small a part of the market. In other words, right now, the, the la large profits that are to be had in, in drug distribution come from the risks involved. You know, you're risking long prison terms. And so, you know, why, who's going to do that? Well, they're only going to do it if they're paid gobs of money. Um, and that that's, drives the price up. If you actually did decriminalize and created some kind of normal regulated distribution method, um, the profits would be way down and, and these murderous cartels would be undermined. If you do it across the board, like across the board. with prohibition, right. it's, the alcohol prices came down. Yes. It's, it's uh, the logical, uh, <clears throat> the economics will, will say that, but, but uh, I was asking because uh, in, in yeah. many experiments that has not uh, happened. Uh, I don't know why, but it I, hasn't. I think, I think it's just too, the it's places, where they, you know, whether it's Portugal or but, Colorado, but, those are too small. But in, in all market. fairness, we really don't know. I mean, we, you know, we, we have an educated guess, but until these policies are implemented and we have you know, enough time to evaluate them, we really don't know with full certainty, right? Yeah, true, but we don't know for sure. But why would it be different from cigarettes right, or alcohol? Right, exactly. In other words, right. you have normal companies supplying exactly. cigarettes and alcohol. You don't have this you know, awful, murderous violence attached to it because the profits are normal corporate profits. It's not these exaggerated profits that come from having to take the risk of spending the rest of your life in jail. Like, like I said, uh, between 2 to $20 billion will be taken away from drug cartels in Mexico with marijuana legalization in the US. That's a lot of money cor for corruption, for arms, for violence. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question over here. I know we can get the mic. And then one over here, so we can put one on each side. Thank you. Um, I might be under the mistaken assumption that we're talking drugs just as marijuana, or are we talking about drugs across the board? Because I'm absolutely uh, convinced that we do need different policy. We need a lot more interconnection between countries and dealing with all that on drugs generally. Mm -hmm. I'm on the fence about the legalization of marijuana, um, only because we know what alcohol does. It's been incredibly destructive, and yet a very enjoyable, as well, way of socializing. It's a very social drug in that sense. Marijuana it has changed over the years. It, it, you know, there's lots of different forms of it. There's skunk, there's all sorts of things that have very, very serious health implications. And the effects that marijuana have at that level almost are the equivalent of 30 years of binge drinking. I mean, it, it happens very quickly in terms of loss of memory, uh, certain areas, your, your lungs, you know, caving in, all that sort of thing. And these kids are doing it uh, at levels that are very dangerous. But I am not, I don't know if I'm against legalization of marijuana. And what I'm seeing here is a sort of mix up. I find heroin and ecstasy and other drugs very different in a way to marijuana, although there are health implications to marijuana, as there is to alcohol, as or there tobacco. is to anything, or tobacco. Tobacco, though, is it's a social thing. Yeah, it's the most addictive drug known to mankind. It's the most addictive, but, no, it's, not tobacco, but, but you cigarettes. can yeah. function socially within a community. You don't have to become a criminal. Right. Um, what my question is, do you differentiate seriously between, for example, marijuana and what's happening now in the States and other hard drugs? Hard drugs. Or is it just across the board here? I think it's an excellent question. Uh, who wants to address it? It's, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, and, and a lot of discussions are being made about that exact uh, issue. Um, many people say, well, marijuana is the first step and cocaine is the second. You know, one induces the other. Some people have that theory. Some people say they have proof of that. Um, if, you, if you approach this problem from uh, the point of view of taking away the profits from the gangs that are, the criminal gangs that are growing because of those profits, one would say then you have to do this with all drugs. Uh, yeah. The, the, the uh, public policy uh, health issue, I would say, should be different. Marijuana is different from coke, and coke, cocaine is different from uh, uh, heroin, uh, ecstasy heroin. Or, or heroin. I mean, heroin is the most addictive, uh, it's the queen of all drugs. That's why it's called heroin. Right behind uh, cigarettes. So, so, so I would say uh, that uh, you need a differential approach from the health public policy point of view. 
So I, I think the economics of this is, and, and I don't come at it just from an economic standpoint, but I think it's interesting to maybe have that discussion economically, because we've, we've heard here that if we'll take the economics out of this, then it will go away to, to a manageable degree. We take away the, uh, the, uh, the violence and, and those types of things. But the question for me is if the economics of this is what really drives us. And we as a society and we as government say it is okay for you to smoke marijuana. We have decriminalized it. Basically make it say that it's okay for you to use be thoughtful about it. Here are the bad things that, that come from it. What is that going to cost society? I mean, what is the medical cost to this, uh, to this world when we send that message, when, when influential men and women stand up in front of these young, influent, influenceable young people and say, it is okay? Is it more than the cost of that money to the cartel, or is it less? I don't know. I think I it's say, an issue of yeah. if the exactly. devils of prohibition outweigh those yeah. of legalization. But, but also this, this question of okay, I mean, I don't think anybody would say that the message around cigarettes is that it's okay. The governmental message on cigarettes is these are awful for you, but, but you have a right to have use it. But how much money spent selling that message over the last 40 years? When I was a kid, watching those actors and actresses on TV, the message was, it's okay. And that's gone. And we don't gone. do that anymore. But we, how much did we spend to reverse that? I'm just not sure as a society we want to start down that path and then 30 years from now going, you know what, we made a mistake no, but in I 2015 but see, I would, and we I need would, to go I, back and re-educate the public about marijuana. I, I would start on day one saying, you know, drugs don't use drugs. Yeah. Not good for you. Um, but it's your right, and the harm from criminalizing that use is much worse than whatever public health consequences well, are there from would, use. I would ask the governor, do, do we agree that uh, what we've been doing Always for the last... when you start out a question like that. <laughs> <laughs> 40 years. Uh, how long ago, uh, Mr. Kofi Annan, uh, the UN declared war on drugs? 40 years ago. Are we better off? Well, you know, I, I asked this question, uh, how long have we been at the war on terror? Yeah. No, I mean, let's, 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 let's stick to that, to that first war, the war on drugs. <laughs> but, but I think there is a point here in the, in the, in the did, did we fight the war on drugs correctly every day? No. Over the, 40, over the last 40 Has years. Has the war on terror been fought correctly every day? No. Two different so, wars. But, well, they are, but, but the point is, Should it have been a war 40 on years of, 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 of war on drugs. I can't change what's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. What I can do as the governor of, of the second largest mm -hmm. state uh, in, in the nation is to implement policies that start us towards a decriminalization and keep young people from going into prison uh, that can destroy their lives. That's what we've done over the last decade. So I, I think there is some innovation that is going on in the states that can translate uh, not just to Oklahoma or California or New York, but to Switzerland, to France, to other countries that have this drug uh, issue facing them, that there are some alternatives without going kind of that big full step and saying we're going to decriminalize and send the message, Patricia, that yeah. it's okay. But what if, what, if you, what if, Governor Perry, what if you were to take this step as an interim measure? Keep the criminal law where it is. But just as a matter of policy, you're the governor, say, we are not going to prosecute people. We're going to ignore this criminal law for now. We're going to put all drug users into these alternative courts where you deal with, you know, treatment or whatever, you know, non- Which are very controversial. Yeah. Yes. But that, you know, that way you're still keeping the message. It's still a crime. You're not saying it's okay, but you're stopping the imprisonment of people. And, and I, you I, also I, say that you deal harshly with the dealers, yes. with the drug dealers and those yes. who corrupt the young ones in society. Yeah. So there is some legitimacy in that argument. Yeah. And you're seeing some states take steps in, in, into that, uh, in that direction, as we've done uh, in Texas. So, uh, but the idea that, uh, again, I believe in the judicial system. Sometimes I don't agree with the federal courts in Texas and the country and the Supreme Court, but I yeah. do live with yeah. their <laughs> decisions. But the fact is, 
I trust the courts. The legislature sets policy directing the courts and then leave those, if, if the legislature wants to say, you know what, we're going to across the board uh, legalize this, then th those states should be allowed to make those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you're in charge of prosecution. In other words, yeah. the legislature sets the law. You as governor, working with your attorney general, decide which laws to enforce and which not. And, and no, you, you no, no, as no. the executive. I, I disagree with you there. I follow the direction from the legislature. They make the law. Now, there's a point in time where, as the chief executive officer, I get to either veto it or sign it. But I, I don't, after they... Uh, lay out the law, get to interpret what that law is. Yeah, but what you can do now, is say, I've got limited, I've got limited that, prosecutorial yeah. resources, limited prison resources. Don't I'm going to focus those limited resources yeah. on Let's, more important things, on murder, yeah. on, on domestic violence. Let's, I'm going to not waste resources for the time being. I argue that it. we have done that in the state of Texas as well as any state. It's the reason that our prison population is at 96% of its capacity. And you've got California that's well over 150%. Yeah. But that's, that's no, what, but you no, want to no. say something? No, I was going to say that I applaud your efforts and the initiatives you are taking in, uh, in your state. But that is precisely what the Global Commission report requests, that we should look at these young people, approach it from education and health point of view, not automatically throw them into uh, prisons. And from what you are telling us, this is happening today in Texas, and I think that is great. Uh, and I hope others We'll, up, we'll take that enlightened approach. And when I started, I said drugs, which we all agree are bad, have destroyed many lives. But wrong governmental policies have destroyed many more. And you are beginning to roll that back in Texas. And that is what we would want to see happen in other cities. Let's leave the money side apart, but the protection of the young people, making sure they don't come out of prison worse off, with no prospects for the future. And we say, we've improved society. We lock them up because they had a gram of marijuana. And, and I think yeah, what you are doing is, is, is a right. And it's in the spirit of the recommendations of the Global Commission. And I applaud you. We have the last one question, then last question over here. Yes, my name is Adam Blackwell from the Organization of American States, the organization that produced uh, uh, the drug report that uh, President Santos uh, referred. And thank you again for your leadership, sir. Uh, I'd also like to do a shout out for the Global Agenda Council that I happen to lead um, of the World Economic Forum on illicit trade and organized crime, because I think one of the issues that you have spoken about is how do we get and how do we trace and how do we deal with the financial flows. Uh, and this comes to, to my question uh, to all of you or any of you. Um, do we really think that these criminal networks or criminal enterprises, um, if we take away the drug uh, economy, are uh, not going to move to something else. Yeah. And what is that else? Uh, that is a, a common I, I will, I, I will answer yeah. that. Um, we're not going to do away with organized crime. They go to some other uh, illegal mining or whatever. But you're seeing a phenomena which is extremely dangerous and extremely harmful. Small bands, small kids uh, in the micro traffic. There, you can make a difference. And uh, going back to something that Mr. Kofinan mentioned, uh, education. Mm -hmm. When one goes to the communities and discusses with the mothers this issue, and you start by asking, would you agree with decriminalization, and they all say no, because they have a paradigm. They say drugs, gangs, uh, and the, the violence in the neighborhood, they connect that. When you explain to them the whole issue, they start changing their minds. And that brings me back to the, the basic problem, the political problem. Uh, why has the world not changed its view on, on this issue? Because politically, it's very costly. You have to make a tremendous effort, education effort, to make the change viable. And that's what we have the res responsibility, responsibility to do. 
the OAS uh, 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 study, which is a great study. They made a, a marvelous uh, exercise uh, through scenarios using a, a, a methodology which was, which was uh, geared towards making people who had very different views agree on something. Uh, we have to start by, uh, by analyzing the different scenarios and, and making a tremendous effort in educating the public in order to make the political decision viable. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I think this, this discussion proves that we have to study the problem much more. We don't have uh, hard data that allow us to make concrete, uh, defined decisions. Uh, we know where, where we should start going to, towards a new direction, but what exactly? Where do you draw the line? You, know, you, you were talking about decriminalization or maybe a little bit more. Where do you draw the line? I don't have the answer, but we need to find this, this answer, all of us together. No, I wanted to go back to the, uh, the lady who asked the first question. She started one of the premises she based her question on is that we are creating the impression it's OK to use drugs. Nobody on this panel is advocating that. We all agree it's a terrible problem. Drugs are bad, and one should try and discourage people, particularly young people, from using drugs or becoming engaged. What we are saying is the repressive laws, measures have not worked. In fact, it's caused more problems. You, you arrest a young person with a bit of a cocaine or marijuana and you throw him in jail for 20 years. As a mother, what do you do with that son when he comes out? What's the future for him? And we are saying, instead of that, educate these people, give them advice, give them uh, health uh, uh, support and don't throw them in jail and destroy their lives. But I, I think, I think, no, yeah, yeah, and I think the, the issue is you, ha you have, um, when you talk about drug policy, you have two components, a public yeah. health component and a public safety component. I think what's been discussed here is how do we subtract the public safety component that's been so harmful, um, this punitive uh, approach to, to uh, drug policy from, from the equation. One last question over here. Former Secretary uh, Kofi Annan, I really appreciate that you have brought to this um, debate the importance of civil society engagement mm. to this matter. In Latin America, we, I belong to a group named Latin American Platform mm. on Drug Policy, which is a civil society movement. I would like to know better your ideas about civil society engagement, since it's a broad and very uh, large uh, concept. Please, thank you. <laughs> I think uh, civil societies have played very important roles in ma on many issues. Um, I recall when we were dealing with the HIV AIDS, for example, there were things we got done that we couldn't have done with our civil society. Richard would agree when we were trying to establish the International Criminal Court in Rome, the Rome Statute, we couldn't have done it with our civil society. On the approval of Millennium Development Goals, you were there. When civil society comes up and they link up and really uh, move an agenda up, the politicians pay attention. You can push an issue up the political agenda for them to say, people are interested in this. We need to take a look at this. Not, not just make noise, but put forward proposals and link up with other civil society organizations in Latin America and around the world and your voice uh, will be heard. Politicians know what hurts and what pays. <laughs> um, we have just yeah. a couple of minutes. So just as we started, let's uh, conclude with uh, two to three sentences. Uh, and I'm going to start again with you, Kenneth, putting you on the spot. Well, um, first, just responding to a few of the things that came up. I mean, there, I think we are talking about all drugs, but you don't necessarily want to keep, treat each drug the same. Um, and that you, uh, first of all, by decriminalizing and regulating, 
you can start controlling the dosages that are available. So you're not just trusting some black market. You, know, you can go and look at the packaging, and it's listed there what you're getting. So that actually improves public safety. Um, we have to recognize that there's certain things, you know, just as you don't want to drive when you're drinking, there's certain things you shouldn't be doing when you're using coke or marijuana. And, and to regulate what you can do while you're using certain drugs is a pr perfectly appropriate public safety thing. But that doesn't mean you criminalize every single use. In terms of the, the question, um, you know, how do we know that these cartels won't just move on to some other crime? That is a concern, because when you have created this you know, virtual army that can outgun the local police, you know, yes, the, the drug market may dry up, but they can move on to extortion or, or kidnapping or trafficking. Do, which they do, yes. Um, <laughs> they, but the, um, but I, there's nothing like the profit of, um, of the drug trade right now. So if you, if you deflate that balloon, you are um, making it more difficult for these heavily armed cartels to maintain themselves, and you're reducing the incentive for people to come in there who see that this is you know, the easy route to the easy life. Right. Um, you know, nobody goes flocking to a cigarette company because of the enormous profits to be made. You know, nobody's jumping to get in with you know, their AK-47 so they can distribute beer. You know, these are just like normal, boring markets now. Um, that's what we want to make the drug market. And they're, they're telling me that we have very short time, so. Uh, simply, uh, the simple fact that we are discussing this issue here at the World Economic Forum is a great step forward. This issue must be discussed by everybody, by the whole world. And through that discussion, try to find more effective ways to deal with this problem that we are not being successful in dealing with the problem. And uh, the more discussion we have, uh, the issues that were brought here uh, demonstrate how difficult it is, the different approaches. But it's very, very important to discuss it and, and try to start building consensus. The civil society must play a, a very proactive role. Politicians must be a bit less uh, uh, hypocritic in the sense of bringing the issue and discussing it openly with the public. It's, it's such a hot issue politically that Thanks. people simply don't like to discuss it. We must discuss it because the problem is growing. Yes. Thank you, President Santos. Governor Perry. Enrique, thank you. I, I, can't, I don't think I can add anything to the discussion we've already had for the last hour. Uh, but I want to say again thanks to Professor uh, Schwab for allowing me to be on the stage with uh, uh, some individuals who I have great admiration for. Richard, thank you for your passion. And for all of you, uh, thank you for being here and being engaged in this process, because the fact is, without you, uh, it would be pretty boring up here, even with Kofi Annan. You were a great sport about it. Thank you so much, Governor Perry. No, I, I think it is uh, increasingly accepted that the current policies on uh, uh, drugs are not working and that we need to take a very serious look at it and make the adjustments necessary. And I'm glad that some courageous leaders are taking the lead and uh, I would hope that we would also have a very serious public debate that will push this issue further. And we at Univision and Fusion want to chronicle that debate, and we appreciate uh, your participation in this forum, and of course, uh, the World Economic Forum for having the courage to, to promote this, this discussion today. So thank you so much, and thanks everyone for being here today.